قال الله تعالى في كلامه المجيد إن الدين عند الله الإسلام قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم My dear respected brothers, sisters, elders and children Alhamdulillah ta'ala Today we are here today together to perform our Salatul Jum'ah and inshallah Aziz we will continue with our topic of last week which was bid'ah which was innovation the concept of innovation in Quran and in Sunnah what is the concept of bid'ah according to the light of the Quran and the Sunnah and what did the Sahaba the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam understand from bid'ah what was their understanding from bid'ah? What did they perceive about bid'ah? And what did they consider bid'ah? This is what we were talking about. And last week, we discussed that according to the Sahaba, according to who? The Sahaba, which are the companions of the Prophet wasallam, they classified bid'ah, innovation, in two categories. And one was bid'ah lughiyya, and one was bid'ah shari'iyya. Bid'ah lughiyya is the bid'ah which is an innovation but it is a good innovation which is considered also as bid'ah hasana. And then bid'ah shari'iyya according to Allama ibn Taymiyyah in his book which he wrote Minhaj al-Sunnah and in his book which he wrote uh, Majma' al-Fatawa in his Fatawa collection. He said and there is a, shari- there is a bid'ah shari'iyya there is also one bid'ah which is considered bid'ah shari'iyya and this bid'ah is bid'ah sayyi'ah. This bid'ah is a wrong and an evil innovation. So we, last week I gave many examples of bid'ah hasana, of a bid'ah lughiyya. The collection of the Quran is a bid'ah, but the bid'ah hasana, bid'ah lughiyya. So bid'ah lughiyya is a good innovation, ahsan innovation, which is allowed in Islam. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala who he enrolled the second azan in Juma is bid'ah lughiyya is also allowed to make a khilaf of the Kaaba the cloth of the Kaaba is a bid'ah lughiyya is also allowed in Islam in the time of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala who there is another event which took place various events took place but which one the one which is relevant to our topic one person he stole from someone and according to the Quran you must Cut the hand of you must cut the hand of, of the person who steals. If there are witnesses and if it if what is whatever is stolen, if it reaches that minimum amount which is set by the fuqaha, it, it reached that amount, that person he himself said that yes, I have stolen. But Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab he did not implement a sariqa He did not order to the hands to be cut from that per- of that person. Why? Because, and this is also a bit, this is an innovation, and you did a new thing. Why? Because he understood something else from it, and he used his wisdom. wisdom. Another event which took place during the time of Umar ibn Khattab, anhu, normally people who were prisoners, they used to be boycotted, and they used to send from Mulk Badr, the Watan al Badr, which means they used to be sent away from their own city, from their own Watan, to another place for eight, at least one year. This happened in the time of the Prophet ﷺ as well. People used to get the punishment according to Sharia, which is the Had, and then on top of that, they used to be sent for one year away from that city in which they lived. During the time of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, a person, he stole and he also received the punishment and a person he accept of that there was another event which took place a person he did not only steal he committed adultery and he was not married so the rajam will not take place you will you will stone him hundred with hundred stones he was stoned but the second thing which is on top of that according to sharia law which is to send him away from his city for one year at least that did not take place why? Because Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala, who he sent before this happened, he sent another person, a couple of months before, he sent that person, and that person Rabi'ah bin Umiyyah, Umayyah. He sent that person who 
uh, consumed alcohol. He sent that person for one year out of the city. And he sent him to Rome. That person, when he went to Rome, he got friendly with Heracles and his army. And he accepted Christianity. He left Islam. He became a murtad. He became a murtad. He left Islam. The reason is because on top of the punishment, he was also sent away from his city. And he was sent as a punishment into another city, which was a Christian city. And when he went there, he accepted Christianity. Because hatred in him started growing against Islam. He was not yet on a high level of Iman that he could go through that hard punishment and then still have his Iman. Which is the situation of the Ummah today. We, when it is easy, Ramadan is easy, we, you know, we accept it. But when there are hard rules, we don't accept them. And suppose if we live in such a society, many Muslims nowadays, they do not want Sharia law. Many Muslims, they don't want Sharia law. Because they consider this to be inhuman. This is what some people, Muslims, consider. They consider this to be against their so-called human rights. Why? Because they don't have the understanding yet. They don't have the fiqh, the, the understanding of the rulings. They don't see it from a different perspective. They don't see the advantages of them. Why? Because the advantages have not been presented to them. They only have seen one negative image of those rulings of Sharia law. So whenever even Muslims, they hear Sharia law, they say, no, we don't want Sharia law. And they, they, I can give you an example. In Pakistan, 50 years, this country was built because of la ilaha illallah. But has Sharia law been implemented? No, because people do not want Sharia law. Not because there is, you know, there is something wrong in Sharia law. Sharia law is weak. Sharia law is not implement, implementable on this, in, this human, in this modern era. No, that is not the case. The reason is because people do not understand it. It has not been well presented in front of them. So the same case, Umar ibn Khattab in, in that time, there was a person who did not have that understanding of Sharia law yet. He did not understand the fiqh, the understanding, the wisdom behind it. So what he did was after receiving punishment, when he was sent away to another city, he went with the friends of Heracles, Heracles and he became a Christian. Umar ibn Khattab, when he came to know this, a person has accepted Christianity. A person has accepted Christianity and he has actually been a murtad now because I sent him away for one year as a punishment. Umar ibn Khattab said, Wallah, from now on, Umar ibn Khattab, he will not send somebody, somebody away to another city because maybe he also will become a Christian. He also may be, uh, leave Islam. So he said, I will, yes, punish the person here, but I will not send him in another city anymore. So Umar ibn Khattab, that event which took place, which I'm telling you, he did not send that person away to another city. He did give them a punishment, but he did not send him away, which is also part of that punishment. So what he did was, simply speaking in simple words, he edited, he edited little bit the punishment set by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. And now somebody can say, but this is, this is wrong, this is bid'ah. Yes, it is bid'ah. Allama ibn Taymiyyah in Minhaj Sunnah, Majma al Fatawa, he says, he says, he says, this is a bid'ah. He says, but this is bid'ah lughiya, this is a good innovation. And why? He says, because the, the reason why Amr ibn Khattab innovated and he invented this was just to cause Islam strength. This is for the betterment of Islam. And he said that he did not change anything at all completely he just added it a little bit and umar ibn khattab does have the authority to do that but we don't have that authority also an important point so nobody should now understand from what i am telling that now we can also change sharia of rasulullah according to our own desires according to our own wills according to our own wisdoms we do not have the wisdom of umar ibn khattab why umar ibn khattab is the one holy prophet said i have two advisors I counsel with them from heaven, Mekail Jibrail, and two from earth, Abu Bakr and Umar. We are not the ones which are being consulted by the Prophet. It is Umar ibn Khattab. So, this is the important thing. But the main thing is there is bid'a luhiyya. Today, I wanted to talk about bid'a shar'iyya. Because, okay, we understand every innovation which is good, which, which motivates people, inspires people, which makes people follow Islam, makes people practice more. For example, after every namaz, some people today in Pakistan and in India, they read from a specific book called Fazail-e-Amal. 
you know, fazail amal some tablighi brothers, tablighi jamaat people, they, they read from that. This is also bid'ah. But this is a bid'ah hasana. This is a good innovation. Why? Because by reading that, and by hearing the narrations of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these people then become motivated, they become inspired. Some people every Friday night or every Thursday night, they come together in a mosque or every Sunday night and they read Quran together, they read Nasheed together. They remember Allah and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They do zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together. Also this is bid'ah, but this is bid'ah lughiyah, this is bid'ah bid hasana. This is good innovation which is allowed in the sharia of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, like some people nowadays, instead of, you know, there is a very big, very, very big congregation, international congregation set by the Sharia of Prophet Wasallam, which is known as the Hajj. Every year people from around the world, they go there. This is part of Islam. But sometimes, for example, nowadays you have some, some big congregations, international congregations, people from East and West, various different Muslim countries, they go there. For example, there is one ijtima which takes place in Multan every year in Pakistan. Sunni Dawat Islami, they hold it. There is another which is Raivan. Pakistani brothers, you know that, but Raivan, you know ijtima. It takes place every year. Many people from different various countries go there. This is a bid'ah to go especially with the intention of going to a different place than Makkah and Medina. Except of these two places, this is bid'ah. Holy Prophet he also said, this is bid'ah, but this is bid'ah hasana, bid'ah lughiya. Because it motivates people, it inspires people. It makes them to come closer to Islam, to practice more. It invites them. It's better than going to a nightclub. So to say bid'ah on these things is right, but make sure that it's bid'ah luhiyah. It is a good invention. Mawlid the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for example, celebration, not to talk about Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let me first give you an example. Last Sunday, there was a garage, a Muslim brother, he opened a new garage in Dublin. He invited me there. Uh, you know, he wanted to have the opening ceremony of the garage. Is there anything as an opening ceremony in the time of the Prophet No, there was nothing as an opening ceremony. An opening ceremony for Masjid al-Nabi did not take place. Opening ceremony of Masjid al-Haram did not take place. Opening ceremony of Kaabatullah did not take place. Opening ceremony when the Quran was compiled did not take place. You know, a ceremony in which people come together and they thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something like that didn't happen, but but why is it that some people they nowadays they when they open any business garage for example, if people have sometimes they have children the ni'mah of children when you have a child in your house you arrange a party in your house you arrange a party was this done by the Prophet sallallahu not in the same way we are doing it nowadays we are celebrating birthdays nowadays and the way we celebrated with birthday cakes was this done with by the Prophet sallallahu in that extent, no, it wasn't. Now the question is, should we do it this now or not? Simple, simple rule, brothers. If it is contradicting Quran and Sunnah, then we can't do it. But if it is not contradicting Quran and Sunnah, and the asal, you, the rule, the, the asal, the, the origin of it is to be found in Quran and Sunnah, then these things are all allowed. For example, celebration of a birthday. What are you doing actually? You are thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you got a child, you got a son. So that is the asal of it, the origin of that, to thank Allah is to be found in the Quran. Compilation of the Holy Quran was a bid'ah, but the asal of it, Allah says, inna nahu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafzun, is to be found in the Quran. So when something, a new innovation, has its origin, has its root in Islam, in Quran and Sunnah, and it is a good thing, it motivates people to Islam, and third thing, third thing to keep in mind, and it is not, it, it doesn't become, or it is not considered as farab. Whatever is new invented, even if it is good, if it is considered as farab, as wajib, as compulsory, as a part of Islam, as a compulsory part of Islam, that, that is not allowed. If you consider celebrating the birthday to become wajib or farab in Islam, it is, then it is a bid'ah sayyah, then it becomes a wrong bid'ah. So you have three main rules. First thing is, if a new innovation has a root in Islam, and that root in Islam, and, and third, secondly, it has not been made compulsory on people. It has not been made compulsory on people. People don't consider it as, as farad or wajib. And third, it, 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 it is not something which leads people to evil. It leads them to good. It leads them to practice Islam. Then these bidas are bidah hasana, and these are all allowed in Islam. 
Now the question is, Holy Prophet said, Kullu bid'atin dalala, kullu dalalatin finnar. Holy Prophet mentioned bid'ah. He mentioned bid'ah. So if the Sahaba understood from this hadith, there are two kinds of bid'ahs, and I gave very various references last week. Then we have spoken about bid'ah hasana, good innovation. The question is, then what did they consider as bid'ah sayyah? What did the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam, the tabi'een, the companions of the Sahaba, these people, who did, what did they consider as bid'ah sayyah? What did they consider to be kullu bid'ah, kullu dalalatin finnar, kullu bid'atin dalala? What did they understand from this? So last week I talked about that what is good innovations and the classification of good of bid'ahs, good and wrong. But now the question is, okay, if there are good bid'ahs according to the Sahaba, then of course there are also evil bid'ahs according to the Sahaba. What are evil bid'ahs? Now I would like to mention this, but keep one thing in mind, brothers. You will be surprised, you will be amazed. The things which nowadays people consider as bid'ah, and they start labeling things as bid'ah, bid'ah, this is bid'ah, this is bid'ah, this is bid'ah. Every single act which takes place, they consider it as, it as bid'ah. Celebration of the Prophet wasallam's birthday. Coming together in the mosque when somebody has died, reading Quran for him in a congregation. These things are considered as bid'ah by some people today. And they put labels on bid'ah, very big labels, and they, they tell everybody, be aware, this is bid'ah, this is going against Islam. What they, these people consider as bid'ah, is not what the Sahaba considered as bid'ah. The Sahaba considered something totally different as a bid'ah sayyah, as a wrong bid'ah. They did not consider these things. They did not consider in new good innovations a bid'ah. When, when mosques were built in front of them, they didn't say this is bid'ah. When mosques became beautiful, people started putting, not carpets, but the people starting to putting something, something down. So when you do such that, you, you know, you don't hurt your knees. They didn't consider this as bid'ah sayyah. The companions of the Prophet sallallahu and the tabi'een, when the Quran was, what, not even the Quran, when the hadiths were written, different various forms of branches of knowledge of Sharia were invented. The Arabs were written of the Quran. They did not say this is bid'ah sayyah. In the time of the Prophet sallallahu when these all new inventions took place, good inventions, they never this, uh, considered these as bid'ah sayyah. Now the question is, what did they consider as bid'ah sayyah? What did they consider as bid'ah sayyah? Now, in this time of the Sahaba, they considered bid'ah sayyah as either the khawarij, the mu'tazila, the jahmiya, and the rawafid or batina. They considered some sects as bid'ah. They considered sects of bid'ah, not practices. Some, they, when they said ahl al-bid'ah, when they said people of bid'ah, to someone when they classified when they talk, when they talked about someone and they said who are ahl bid'a they these people those people are ahl bid'a are bid'a people what who did they meant who did they refer to allama ibn taymiyyah says khawarij mu'tazila juhmiya and rawafid the sahaba considered these people of ahl bid'a fakana min awwal al bid'a wa tafarraq alladhi waqa'a fi hadhihi al umma bid'at al khawarij he says, Alam ibn Taymiyyah, the first, first bid'ah, he says, in the, in, the, in the time of Holy Prophet sallam, was the khawarij, the fitna of khawarij. The first disunity which took place was the fitna of khawarij. And then Mu'tazira, then Juhmiyyah, then Rawafid, and Abati, Abadniyyah. I can't explain everything to you now, it's because many things, not everybody will be able to understand. Let me tell, give you some simple, simple things today, brothers. What did they consider as bid'ah? Some people stood up in the time after, in the time of the companions. They said, they said, some people they said, if someone commits a sin, commits a sin, a guna, commits a sin, then he becomes a kafir. He becomes a kafir. Some people they had this faith, believe that if someone steals, if someone's life then according to these people, the one who lies and who steals, who, who be, he becomes a kafir. The Sahaba, they said, the people who say this, this is bid'ah. The Sahaba considered this as bid'ah, sayyah. Secondly, some people, the Khawarij, they said, for example, that whoever acts, whoever's actions are contradicting the Quran and the Sunnah, 
are contradicting the Quran and the Sunnah. Whoever's actions, character is contradicting the Quran and Sunnah, the Sahaba would say, Hua Ahlul Bidah. These are the people of Bidah. So this is Bidah. Nowadays we have a very strange, different concept of Bidah. We put the label of, on everything, Bidah, Bidah. And for example, another, some people, they said about Sayyidina Usman ibn Affan. They said about Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Muawiyah. Radiyallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in. They said about these people that all these three, they about these three specific. They said, we do not accept any narration whatsoever about the Prophet Wasallam statements from these three people. Because of some reasons. So these people who said this, the Sahaba, the Tabi'in said, Hua al bidah these are the people of Bidah. Some people, they did not recognize Rajam. Rajam, stoning to death when somebody become, uh, commits adultery and he is married. Some people did not accept this because this is mentioned in the hadith and there is only one khabar uh, al-wahil uh, hadith. Only one hadith with one chain only. But they, and about the sahih one. So they did not consider this as and, and wahal al-bidah. These are the people of bidah. And also, fifthly, these people who were ahal al-bidah, one other sign of them, in ke kaur nishani, wo ye hai, these used to put the label of kufr on everybody. They used to say, this is a kafir, this is a kafir, this is a kafir. So nowadays, if you find people who say, they are mushrik, they are mushrik, they are kafir, they are kafir, don't sit with them. Such people are ahl bidah according to the Sahaba. People who create this unity in the ummah of the Prophet People who say, don't sit with them, they are mushrik people. People, people who say, those who celebrate the Prophet's birthday, they are mushri. These people and people who say, those who do this are kafir. Those who, this, who do this is are kafir. Those who put the label on kufr on everybody or on some people, the one who puts the label of kufr of somebody, remember this is bidah, according to the Sahaba. Secondly, there was Mu'tazila. Some people considered the Quran as the creation. Some, some people said, Qur'ans are not suf, sifat of Allah. They are not the words of Allah. They are rather the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These people were considered as bid'ah. The rawafid. Some people in the time of the Sahaba. Now the reason brothers who just came now. What I'm mentioning now is. Who did the Sahaba consider ahl bid'ah? Who are ahl bid'ah people? What according to the Sahaba. Allama ibn Taymiyyah again in one of his books. Talbis Iblis he says. That some people, they used to, some people, they used to love Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, but loving him is loving Rasulullah. But they used to go beyond the limit. They used to do khaloob. They used to do khaloob. They used to go beyond the limit in his love. They used to go so much in depth with his love. They used, they used to cross every, every limit. They, they crossed every limit. And they said that Jibreel made a mistake. By giving the first revelation of Iqra to Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was supposed to go to Ali and it was his mistake. Some people who say this, the Sahaba said, Hua ahl bidah these are ahl bidah Not the people who celebrate birthdays, not the people who come in the mosque and do zikr, not the people who do Quran khani, these are not ahl bidah according to the Sahaba. These are all bid'ah, luhiyas, or good innovations. Wrong innovations are saying, Sayyidina Ali is better, khayrun min al-anbiya, better than prophets. Some people said this, and say this nowadays also, some people. This is bid'ah. Some people, they used to talk wrongly about Umar ibn Khattab, and about Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma. These are, huwa ahlul bid'ah, these are people of bid'ah. Oh, another thing, some people, after the Holy Prophet Wasallam's life, they, their aqidah, their belief is, after the Prophet's life, except of a few Sahaba, including Sayyidina Ali, everybody else became murtad. Everybody else became kafir. Some people who at that time had these beliefs, who are Ahlul Bidah, these are Ahlul Bidahs. So brothers, what I'm trying to say is, what I'm trying to explain is, nowadays, when people say, you are, this is bid'ah, this is bid'ah, this is bid'ah. Before accepting what is bid'ah, understand the concept of bid'ah from the Sahaba. The Sahaba never considered bid'ah actions. Good actions were never, never bid'ah according to them. New inventions were not bid'ah according to the Sahaba. Compiling the Quran, even 
putting, reading Jamaat in Taraweeh was not bid'ah according to the Sahaba. According to the Sahaba, what is bid'ah? According to the Sahaba, these beliefs against the Holy Prophet wasallam is bid'ah. And the last thing I would like to say today, what is bid'ah in the muhaddisin? What is bid'ah in the eyes of the muhaddis, of the scholars, and in the Sahaba, in the eyesight of Sahaba? What is bid'ah? Is celebrating birthday of the Prophet wasallam a bid'ah? Some people say so. Is wearing a tie a bid'ah? Some people say so. Is wearing a trouser a bid'ah? Some people say so. But the thing is, by people saying this, it doesn't become bid'ah. Unless the Quran and Sunnah and the Holy Prophet wasallam or his Sahaba say this is bid'ah. The Sahaba considered these things not as bid'ah. Good innovations. Innovations acts which were new, but which made people come and follow Islam, which made their Iman stronger, which made them come to the mosque often, like the Salat al tarabi Celebration of the Prophet ﷺ, it creates the love of the Prophet in your hearts. Celebrating your own birthday is like thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not, it's not a bid'ah, sayyah. All these actions according to the Sahaba were bid'ah hasana, were good innovations. They accepted these innovations. They practiced on these innovations. But what are wrong bidas, wrong ideas, wrong and wrong innovations? These innovations which I mentioned to say that Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala who is better than the Holy Prophet This is bidah sayyah. To for example say whoever commits the sin, he is a kafir. This is a bidah sayyah, it's a wrong innovation. Whoever and, and, and people who say when there is a kafir, there are even some people now, they say, you know these kufr, kafir people, you can steal from them, it doesn't matter, they are kafir. Some people even now they exist. They say stealing from these, their wealth, their khun, their blood is halal on us. This is bid'ah according to the Sahaba. To put, to label people as kafir. This is bid'ah according to the Sahaba. So this is bid'ah. If you find anybody today, brothers, who says these are mushrik, these are kafir, these are bid'ahs, or these are mushriks, then according to the Sahaba, be aware. This person who tells you so about others, he himself is a bidati. He himself is Ahlul Bidah. The person who creates this unity in the Ummah of the Prophet wasallam, and who says, I am, I am just inviting you to good thing. But remember, these people don't submit with them. They are Ahlul Bidah. They are Mushriks. They are Mushriks. The people who call other Mushriks, they are themselves Ahlul Bidah according to the Sahaba and according to Allama ibn Taymiyyah. So the main thing, brothers, about Bidah. The whole topic started because somebody asked me to talk about this briefly. Last week and this week we talked about bid'ah. Somebody asked me, and just to give you a conclusion of the whole two, two last speeches, somebody said to me, after every Juma you do dua collectively, all of you raise your hands collectively. This is bid'ah. And he said, this is wrong, don't do this. Holy Prophet ﷺ never did this. That person, he said so to me. And somebody else was there also. And when I explained this to that person, he did not want to listen. And he said, provide me any hadith in which the Prophet himself did this. Then I will, you know, then I will accept it. Otherwise, I will not accept it. I explained to him, I said, listen, I will bring you a hadith. I can bring you a hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu he himself did dua. But the point is not that I should bring a hadith in which the Prophet did dua. The point is, if you are right, you should bring a hadith in which say, it, it says that it is wrong to do that. And the thing, second point is, this is yes a bid'ah, but this is a good invention, good innovation, good bid'ah. He did not listen. The other person, some brothers, some other brothers, they said, you know, Sheikh, why don't you talk about bid'ah in Jummah? So people may understand what is bid'ah. So very simply, everything which is new in Islam, a new practice, like doing dua after namaz, like in your home when you have a child, inviting people and giving them food. If you open a new office, a new garage, then opening, the opening ceremony, for example. All these things, if they are good, they motivate people, they don't have anything which is contradictory to Sharia. And secondly, if they are not considered as farad, you should not consider Eid Miladun Nabi as farad. You should not consider celebrating your birthday as farad. You should not consider every time after namaz reading fazail amal or any other book as farad. You should not consider these things farad. Then these are all allowed. When somebody <laughs> considers doing dua after Juma a farad, an obligation, a wajib, then it becomes a bid'ah. But as far as I know, I don't consider it as farad. 
Nobody of, of you guys considers it as for us because many of us don't do it. Many of us do it in our hearts. It only becomes a bid'asiyya if it is contradicting the Quran. Asking Allah, doing dua, raising your hands is not contradicting to Quran and Sunnah. Allah says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي أَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٍ Whenever I am prayed to, whenever I am asked to, I am supplicated to, remember that I indeed do listen to the prayers. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the, the true understanding of Islam. The understanding of Islam which was given to us and which was understood by the Sahaba of the Prophet which was understood by the Tabi'een of the Prophet and which was propagated by the Ahl Bayt, by the family of the Prophet